Hi, thank you for watching my video today. Today I'm going to discuss as part of this mini med lecture a uh, the difference between myelopathy and radiculopathy. Now, myelopathy is defined as any pathological condition of the spinal cord, where radiculopathy is defined as any pathological condition of a spinal nerve root. Now, with myelopathy, we are talking about any condition that will affect the integrity of the spinal cord itself. Most commonly, it's going to be some kind of compression or injury. So, uh, for example, a herniated disc in the spinal column will, will cause pressure on either a spinal nerve root or, a, or the spinal cord itself. Now, when the spinal cord is being compressed or injured somehow, it is going to result in a collection of signs or symptoms known as upper motor neuron disease. So upper motor neurons. Now if you remember from anatomy, the upper motor neurons begin in the motor cortex in the cerebrum and extend their axons down through the internal capsule, through the brain stem in the cerebrospinal tract, and down through the spinal cord. And they eventually will synapse on the lower motor neurons at the individual spinal levels. So the upper motor neurons are found within the central nervous system, the brain or spinal cord, whereas the lower motor neurons are the neurons that extend out of the spinal column in the peripheral nerves. Okay, so depending on whether it's an upper motor neuron or a lower, lower motor neuron that's being compressed, the signs and symptoms are going to differ. So with upper motor neuron disease, you are going to have motor weakness, a positive Babinski sign, spasticity, hyperreflexia, and clonus. Now if you remember, a Babinski sign, the way you elicit a Babinski response is take something like uh, like the back end of your reflex hammer, stroke it up the bottom of the patient's foot, and watch what the toes do. Now with a positive or abnormal Babinski sign, you are going to see the large toe come up and the smaller toes will flare or fan out. And this is abnormal and can suggest spinal cord pathology. Now a normal Babinski sign would be the toes curling down. Now, uh, spasticity would be increased tone in the musculature. Hyperreflexia means the, the reflexes, the deep tendon reflexes, are going to be stronger than normal, so you'd be recording it as a 3 plus or a 4 plus reflex. And with myelopathy, it's especially evident in the lower extremity deep tendon reflexes, like the patella reflex or the, the Achilles reflex. Now with clonus, if you remember, the way you elicit abnormal ankle clonus is you quickly dorsiflex the patient's ankle and you will get a uh, little bounce back as a type of reflex. Now one or two pulses back at you is normal, but if you hold, if you hold that ankle in dorsiflexion and that foot continues to bounce or there's sustained uh, bouncing of the foot against your hand, that is an abnormal ankle clonus and also is suggestive of upper motor neuron signs, which are all consistent with myelopathy. Now, radiculopathy is going to be compression or disease of the lower motor neurons, and it's going to produce the following signs. Motor weakness, which is <clears throat> similar to the myelopathy, but uh, you can get weakness with either. You, with sustained or severe radiculopathy, you can end up getting uh, muscle fasciculations or little fast twitch uh, fasciculations of the muscle fibers themselves, or even muscle atrophy because the muscle will eventually start to die and shrink because of the lack of use because the nerve is so compressed. And with lower motor neuron disease, you will get hyper bow reflexia, meaning the, meaning the reflexes will be diminished or even totally blunted. Okay, so again, cervical myelopathy versus cervical radiculopathy. Now, now I say cervical because that's going to be what we're going to be talking about 
as are examples in this lecture. But you can have myelopathy or radiculopathy at all of the levels in uh, the, at the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. Okay, so in the cervical and lumbar spine, obviously the spinal cord is present at all of those levels, as well as spinal nerve roots at each spinal level. In the lumbar spine, it's a little bit different. So in our picture over here on the right, uh, you can see that at about this level is L1, the L1 vertebrae. Okay, so the spinal cord is continuous from the brain stem down through the foramen magnum and down through the spinal column and ends at about L1 in all adults. Okay, now the because the spinal cord ends at L1, it is possible to have a lumbar myelopathy if you have some severe pathology at L1 that would compress the conus medullaris and you would get something called conus medullaris syndrome. Okay, now uh, the majority of neural tissue compression in the lumbar spine is going to be a radiculopathy simply because you the, from L1 down there is no spinal cord to compress it's all spinal nerve roots the cauda equina okay now so if you have a herniated disc or a mass or significant lumbar stenosis in the lumbar region it's going to produce mostly radicular signs or symptoms okay now we're going to talk mostly for the rest of this lecture we're going to talk about cervical myelopathy versus cervical radiculopathy. Okay, no. You can get cervical uh, excuse me thoracic myelopathy and radiculopathy it is just less common because the the rib cage actually provides so much structural support to the thoracic spine that the thoracic spine doesn't see a whole lot of movement or degeneration. Most of the myelopathy or radiculopathy stemming out of the thoracic spine is due to major trauma. Now, let's talk about cervical myelopathy. Now, here's a hypothetical case. Let's say you have a 58-year-old male patient come into your clinic with a chief complaint of weakness and difficulty with walking. Now, as you interview him, you discover that he has the following signs and symptoms. Weakness and sensory disturbances in the arms. So he's got some numbness and tingling as well as he feels that his arms are just weak. Both arms. He also complains of clumsiness and paresthesias in the hands. Okay, so he, he, he might say that his dexterity in the hands is decreased. For example, uh, some patients might say that when they're eating food with a fork, they're just having real difficulty handling that fork with their hand. And they may also, our patient will also possibly complain of weakness and spasticity in the legs. He'll just feel like his legs are heavy and, and almost uh, elastic-like and has difficulty walking. And that we would call that a spastic gait. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so based on our, our interview with the patient and his signs and symptoms, Several disorders should come to our mind as part of our differential diagnosis, uh, one of them being amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, patients with Lou Gehrig's disease will complain of progressing weakness in the extremities. Uh, the difference and kind of the cardinal difference between myelopathy versus a a ALS is that ALS will be strictly motor neuron you will not have a sensory deficit. So if the patient is having numbness and tingling in the hands uh, as part of his chief complaint, it's less likely that ALS is on your uh, differential, but you need to keep it in mind. Multiple sclerosis can also cause upper motor neuron uh, symptoms because of demyelination within the central nervous system. Uh, so that needs to stay on your differential diagnosis. Now, a carpal tunnel syndrome, if your patient is complaining of pretty significant numbness and tingling in the hands, that can all obviously be uh, indicative of a carpal tunnel syndrome. The main difference here is that if your patient has symptoms in the lower extremities as well as they will with myelopathy, then it's less likely that it's just carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, syringomyelia, excuse me, syringomyelia is when there is a syrinx that forms within the spinal cord. And this can, uh, can be spontaneous or due to trauma and can result in uh, upper motor neuron symptoms. 
and that will show up on an MRI. Now, Guillain-Barre syndrome should remain on your differential diagnosis any time a patient shows up with weakness in the extremities. Uh, characteristic with Guillain-Barre is that the weakness will uh, kind of begin distally and, ex and gradually progress proximally. So remember that. Now, spinocerebellar degeneration uh, that you can see with patients with a history of chronic alcohol use uh, should also be on the differential, although this mainly presents as gait ataxia, balance problems, difficulty walking, um, but does need to be considered. Tri traumatic myelopathy should be considered. A transverse myelitis needs to be considered because that'll have upper motor neuron signs and of course our cervical myelopathy. So when you have a patient that presents with these signs and symptoms you do need to consider getting an MRI of the cervical spine or even the cervical and thoracic spine. Now with uh, the further characteristics of cervical myelopathy uh, usually this will be a painless process. Uh, compression of the spinal cord itself is not painful uh, for the most part. That being said, patients will occasionally have painful sensations. Uh, some patients will get uh, what we call a Lermite sign, which is when they bend their neck down, their chin down to, your, down to their chest. They'll get almost like a shock-like electrical sensation through the body, especially down the spine. Um, or sometimes patients will also present with kind of aching pains in the shoulders and and trapezius region uh, and present with a myelopathy. So while it is painless for the most part, patients can have some pain. Now it's usually slowly progressive. It can be sudden onset, for example, if a patient has a whiplash injury and has a massive herniated disc in the neck causing a spinal cord compression, that's obviously uh, can be a myelopathy, but uh, due to degenerative changes alone, it'll be slowly progressing. Now with severe cases or uh, uh, cases that have progressed slowly over years, the patient can have bowel and bladder dysfunction. They'll, you know, they'll start dribbling urine, they'll have a hard time emptying their bladder completely. Uh, they might even have episodes of bowel incontinence, so that is something to consider as well. On your exam, you're going to find spasticity in the upper and lower extremities. The muscles are going to have increased tone. Their gait is going to be spastic, or almost uh, what we describe as a scissor-like gait, as if their legs are very, very tight and, and kind of quick spastic movements of the legs while they walk. They might have balance problems as well. Uh, the extremities are oftentimes going to be weak. You'll, you'll be able to, to pull against them and, and they'll, they'll give way uh, somewhat easily in the arms and legs. Um, they may have sensory disturbances in the extremities. Pretty common with a severe cervical stenosis is something called central cord syndrome where the patient will have numbness and tingling in the hands and that may or may not improve after surgical intervention. Uh, you'll also notice hyperreflexia, like we talked about, they'll, the, especially in the legs. They'll, their patella reflex is going to be extremely strong, so make sure you are standing to the side and so you don't get kicked. <laughs> uh, there, you'll see a positive Babinski sign often, and you'll have abnormal ankle clonus often as well. Uh, and then we already talked about this Lermite sign. It looks like I misplaced uh, my apostrophe there, but... Uh, again, Lermites is when you have them bend their chin down to their chest and they'll get almost a shock-like sensation. And that's, that's kind of an ominous sign as it does suggest pretty severe spinal cord compression. But can also be found in conditions like uh, multiple sclerosis, for example. Now in this diagram, this is uh, representing some spinal cord compression. Now, as you can see right here where it's circled, this is... Uh, representing maybe some bone spurring that can happen with cervical spondylosis, uh, a degenerative change of the cervical spine, and you'll get from the vertebral body of the cervical vertebrae uh, posterior bone spurring. So the, the spinal column where the, the central canal where the spinal cord travels will be decreased in its AP diameter due to this uh, paracentral spurring. You can also get something called ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, which is the ligamentum flavum here on the posterior arch, 
will uh, start to thicken and hypertrophy and causes compression of the spinal cord from behind. And so any compression of the spinal cord there can cause this uh, upper motor neurons disease or cervical myelopathy. Uh, sorry, you can maybe hear the thunder outside having a thunderstorm. <laughs> now this is an MRI of a patient with severe cervical myelopathy or cervical stenosis. Now, as you can see here uh, where the brain stem turns into the spinal cord and leaves the, the leaves the cranium, the here at the C12 level there is plenty of space for the spinal cord. Uh, there's a lot, of this, the white is the cerebral spinal fluid, and there's a lot of fluid in front of and behind the cord, so there's a lot of room there. But as you get down into this C3-4 and C4-5 and even the C5-6 level, you can see there's pretty severe spinal cord compression. Now this is due to g degenerative changes, uh, long-term changes. We There's some hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavin, flavum back here, and there is cervical spondylosis with degenerative disc disease here coming from anterior. So we've kind of got compression from both anterior and posterior. Now if you can see right in here at the C3-4 level, right inside the cord, there is almost a lighter area inside the cord, a hyper-intense area. Now that is suggestive of a possible cervical cord contusion, and that can... Uh, result in more long-term problems, meaning it it's suggests some permanent damage that's been done within the cord, even after decompression. So, Now, with a patient with such severe uh, cervical stenosis like this, surgical intervention is needed. It's just going to get worse. It's not going to get better on its own. So surgery, in this case, now on this uh, slide, is this is the same patient after surgery. This is an immediate post-op x-ray, and this patient underwent what we would call a front-back surgery, meaning they had an anterior decompression as well as a, a posterior decompression because their stenosis was so severe. So severe. Now, here in the front, uh, the front approach is what we call an ACDF, or an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. Now, here from C3, three, four, and five. So at the C3, four level, the intervertebral disc was removed as well as at the C4, five level. So from a approach from the front, the intervertebral discs are removed to decompress the spinal cord. And they usually try to shave off a little bit of the bone as well while they're in there to get rid of the bone spurs that are also pushing on the cord. They re replace the intervertebral discs with some kind of a bone graft. Uh, oftentimes it's an autologous bone graft uh, from a, a cadaver or uh, the, like a, a cage of some form from a company that might produce these intervertebral cage uh, grafts. And then a plate is placed on the front that's usually a titanium plate with titanium screws to hold everything together while it heals. So this is an anterior cervical discectomy infusion for anterior decompression of the spinal cord. Now this patient also went under for a uh, posterior decompression. And you can see back here on the back, actually, there's a skin staple still present uh, in this x-ray. And, and, and right here you can see uh, what is the drain that uh, is still in the patient uh, post-operatively that will be removed. Now, the as part of a posterior decompression, the spinous processes of the the C3, C4, and C5 vertebrae have been remo removed, as well as the lamina. So this is what we would call a cervical laminectomy, which does a posterior decompression. Okay. Now this is a post-op MRI of the same patient. And if you remember here from the C3 through C5 area, there was some significant compression of the spinal cord, and in this post-op MRI, the spinal cord has been completely freed and decompressed. Uh, there is possibly a little tiny cord contusion here at this level. It's hard to tell really, uh, but for the most part the spinal cord is fully decompressed. You can see here there's bone missing in the back and it's all fused in the front for structural stability, uh, but postoperatively a very nice decompression. 
So again, cervical myelopathy uh, results from compression of the spinal cord resulting in an upper motor neuron uh, presentation with a positive Babinski, spasticity, weakness in the extremities, even some uh, hyperreflexia and abnormal clonus. And you can, along with those, get uh, sensory deficits like numbness and tingling in the hands and even into the legs. Now, let's contrast that with the radiculopathy like we talked, which radiculopathy is a compression of the spinal nerve roots. Now, this produces a lower motor neuron uh, presentation uh, with weakness, fasciculations, atrophy, and hyporeflexia. Now, most of the time with a re acute uh, radiculopathy, you're going to get uh, pain, paresthesias, as well as possibly weakness and hyporeflexia. The fasciculations and the atrophy are, are uh, severe signs that don't develop until it's been a prolonged compression of that nerve. Now our hypothetical case for cervical radiculopathy. Uh, a 42-year-old female patient presents to your clinic with a chief complaint of neck and arm pain. As you interview her, you discover that she has the following signs and symptoms. She complains of sharp shooting, almost electrical-like shooting pains down into her right arm coming from the neck. Uh, she also has some numbness and tingling along that same route in the arm. Uh, she also complains of some weakness with the right hand when she is gripping onto objects. She feels that her hand is actually weak. She does not complain of any problems with the legs or with the left arm. It's solely her right arm that is bothering her. And the pain in her arm is made worse with certain neck movements. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, I think, but... Uh, Specifically, if you were to have a patient with a cervical radiculopathy tip their head laterally towards the arm that is bothering them, they may have a reproduction of that sharp shooting pain into their arm, and that is what we would call a positive spurling sign, which is uh, indicative of a cervical radiculopathy of some sort. Now, uh, also on your differential diagnosis, when a patient presents with these kinds of signs or symptoms, you need to keep in mind other options, um, including shoulder pathology. Uh, obviously, if the pain is only in the shoulder region, you need to keep in mind uh, possibly like an AC joint injury, a gleno, uh, glenohumeral uh, subluxation, fractures in the, in the joint, a slap lesion, uh, rotator cuff injury, so keep that in mind as well. Carpal tunnel syndrome, if your patient's having numbness and tingling in the hand, uh, you need to make sure it's not just a carpal tunnel syndrome. A pancoast tumor is something that is uh, maybe oftentimes left off of the differential in this situation, but it should not be, especially if your patient has a long history of smoking or has a lot of recent coughing. A pancos tumor, which is a lung cancer, a neoplasm in the apex of the lung, uh, if that tumor is strategically located and large, can press on the brachial plexus as it's leaving the cervical spine region. And if that tumor is pushing hard enough on this brachial plexus, you'll get ridiculous signs and symptoms down into the, 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 that extremity on that side. Um, so pancos tumor needs to be on the differential diagnosis for radicular symptoms. Now an ulnar neuropathy at the elbow uh, needs to be considered as well. As the ulnar nerve travels through the cubital tunnel at the elbow, uh, it can be compressed due to hypertrophy of that, li that ligament, just like carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, the difference with ulnar neuropathy is that your patient, for the most part, is going to pinpoint the elbow as the epicenter of their pain and they'll have a oftentimes a positive tenel sign over the cubital tunnel. A brachial plexitis needs to be considered as well. This is also called a Parsonage Turner syndrome. Um, it's something that's oftentimes forgotten. Um, it's not a very common diagnosis but uh, can be severe and, and quite painful for patients. Um, It'll present with shoulder and arm pain and paresthesias and even weakness in the extremity. 
Um, it's most of the time idiopathic, or we don't know what causes it, possibly a virus, but it's a, a inflammation of the brachial plexus. Um, now, oftentimes these patients will present just like a classic radiculopathy. They'll get a cervical MRI, and that MRI won't explain their symptoms. Uh, the next step should be, in that situation, a referral to a neurologist for electrodiagnostic studies, an EMG, which will help... Uh, differentiate whether it's a, a specific nerve root involved or whether it's the whole brachial plexus like it would be in Parsonage-Turner syndrome. Now uh, further characteristics of cervical radiculopathy uh, it can be sudden onset or gradual onset uh, if, if your patient for example is lifting something or in a certain way and all of a sudden they have a sharp neck pain with going down into their arm that can suggest like a herniated or bulged disc. Uh, gradual onset due to degenerative changes in the disc uh, and intermittent in nature is uh, uh, probably most common actually. A patient will present saying you know every once in a while every couple months I have this arm pain that just flares up and is severe but then it'll go away but this time it's just not going away so that's something to keep in mind it can be sudden gradual or intermittent in nature now uh, the specific symptoms depend on depend on which level is involved so we're going to talk about those levels and the specific findings with each of those levels on physical exam with a cervical radiculopathy, you might notice motor weakness along certain myotomes uh, that are involved in that nerve root. You may also have paresthesias along a certain dermatome. Now, if it's severe and long-term, you may notice muscle atrophy like we already talked about. You may also have hyporeflexia, which will be unilateral. So, for example, a patient with a C7 radiculopathy on the right side, uh, their left tricep reflex might be normal, but their right tricep reflex might be totally blunted. <clears throat> now, uh, with a cervical radiculopathy, their gait will be unaffected because the spinal cord is not being pinched, and the lower extremities will not be involved either. Now, with a C4-5 pathology, you will have a C5 radiculopathy. So, it's a little different than it is in the lumbar region because the uh, in the cervical region, this, the C5 nerve root will exit just above the pedicle for which it is named. So at C4-5, you will have the C5 nerve root exiting. And so if you have got a herniated disc at C4-5, it's going to hit the C5 nerve root as it exits. So with a C5 radiculopathy, you're going to see pain that goes from the neck into the shoulder and maybe into the proximal arm over the deltoid region. You might have some deltoid weakness, so weakness with abduction of that arm, and you might even see some bicep weakness. You may also see a weak bicep reflex, more commonly with a C6 radiculopathy, however. So with a C5-6 pathology, you'll get a C6 radiculopathy, which will result in a pain and paresthesia into the arm, uh, more specifically the shoulder, lateral arm, and radial side of the forearm, with paresthesia as possible in the thumb and index finger. So thumb and index finger think C6. Now you will get a weak bicep with a C6 radiculopathy, as well as uh, some uh, weak wrist extension, and possibly a loss of the bicep reflex. With a C6-7 pathology, you'll get a C7 radiculopathy, which will result in pain in the scapula, possibly even into the lateral chest wall or axillary region, the medial arm, and ulnar forearm. You'll get oftentimes a paresthesia in the index, middle, or ring finger, most commonly the middle finger. And you can get a tricep muscle weakness as well as a loss of the tricep reflex. With a C7-T1 pathology, you will get a C8 radiculopathy. Remember, there are eight cervical nerve roots. So C8 radiculopathy will result in pain in the scapular region, medial arm, and ulnar forearm as well, uh, with paresthesias into the ring and, uh, more commonly, the little finger. 
but classic to a C8 radiculopathy is weakness in the intrinsic muscles of the hand. So you'll get kind of classically a weak grip strength with C8 as well. Now this diagram uh, nicely covers uh, a, cer a herniated cervical disc. So right here it's showing pathology where the, the herniation from the cervical disc is pushing out and hitting that nerve root as it's exiting the spinal column. Notice that the spinal cord itself is not being compressed, just the spinal nerve. Now, here on our, our uh, sagittal MRI, it looks somewhat similar to our, our cervical myelopathy example in that there's, there's uh, some bulging coming from the anterior uh, side of the central canal, uh, but more specifically when you look at the axial cuts you can see that the disc herniation that's being uh, pointed at with this arrow is hitting the nerve root as it exits and for the most part leaving the spinal cord uninvolved. Uh, the spinal cord itself is not being compressed against this back wall. It's uh, just hitting that nerve root there at that side. This is another example. You can see this, this, uh, the spinal cord here with the cerebral spinal fluid around it, uh, and then you, you can see the herniated disc on this side hitting the nerve root as it's exiting. Now, the, the surgical intervention for a cervical radiculopathy is usually reserved for severe cases or unrelenting cases. A lot of time, especially with younger patients, a cervical radiculopathy due to like a bulged herniated disc uh, is going to resolve with time and conservative treatment, such as uh, NSAIDs, pain medications, maybe physical therapy, uh, rest, maybe time off from uh, work if, if needed, if they have a strenuous job, um, and oftentimes something like a steroid, a Medrel dose pack can really help these patients. Uh, however, if the patient has significant motor weakness due to the spinal nerve root compression, that's an indication for surgery uh, because that, that means it's, it's severe and probably not going to get better. Or if the symptoms are just worsening and not resolving quickly with conservative treatment, surgery can be performed. Now the surgery for a cervical radiculopathy is similar to an anterior approach for a cervical myelopathy in that it's an ACDF or an anterior cervical discectomy, meaning removal of the disc. Now here we've got a, so this is C2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. So this is a C5, 6 anterior cervical discectomy infusion. The surgeon approaches from the front removes the intervertebral disc at that level, decompressing that spinal nerve root, replacing that, that intervertebral disc with this bone graft or a cage of some sort, and then uh, placing a titanium cervical plate across the anterior vertebral bodies and fixing it with uh, two screws at each level. So that's an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion for treatment of a cervical radiculopathy due to a herniated disc or uh, other degenerative changes at that level. So just in quick review, we've got cervical myelopathy, which results in uh, upper motor neuron signs due to compression of the spinal cord. These are the, the signs of upper motor neuron disease with cer cervical or, or you know any kind of radiculopathy it results due to compression of the spinal nerve roots resulting in lower motor neuron signs as well as paresthesias along that same route so cervical myelopathy versus cervical radiculopathy uh, hopefully this has been very educational for you. So thank you very much for watching this presentation I hope you've enjoyed it uh, and found it to be educational and helpful Please uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel and uh, enjoy my other videos. I hope to share a lot more in the future. Thank you.